So this morning, I'm going to talk about a psalm of lament. A psalm of love what? Lament. It means mourning. Now, uh, for some reason, this is just where God led me. I could have picked any psalm, but I didn't pick a psalm of rejoicing, not a psalm of thanksgiving, not a psalm of ascents, not a psalm of praise, not a psalm of Moses, not a psalm of David, not even a psalm of just straight out praise and worship. I picked a psalm of lament. And not just any psalm of lament, I picked the psalm of lament that doesn't end with, but just praise the Lord. No, it stays in the lament. I believe that God has led me to this psalm to teach us how essential lament is. So as we look at the text, if you're not staying, would you stand for the reading of God's word from Psalm 88? A psalm, a psalm of the sons of Korah for the director of music, according to Mehalath Lehanot, a masculine of Haman the Ezraite. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, who you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest depths, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavy on me. You have overwhelmed me with your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have engulfed me. You have taken from me my friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. You may be seated. All right, well, hopefully, <clears throat> Hopefully that was the last boom that we can get the, the sun <laughs> steady from now on. Um, I hope y'all had a good holiday weekend. Um, I My birthday is on July 3rd, so I, the past few years I've made July 4th like kind of my uh, celebration along with America, like yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's really my birthday, I had a beach day, my food came out. Um, I got a little burn, but you know, I'm white, so that happens and that. <laughs> It was fun. It was, it was good. Um, and thinking about uh, Independence Day, uh, I thought about uh, when my family was in town just a few months ago in April, we went to Philadelphia uh, to see a lot of the historical sites. Uh, where are my Philly people? Yeah, we're going to come out there. Um, I have been to Philly a number of times, but I've never been to all the historical sites to see the, to see the things. So uh, we went, and I remember uh, we went to Independence Hall. Um, can we can we put that picture up? This is I took this picture. Um, this is where the Continental Congress met, uh, 13 colonies, and they uh, came up with the Declaration of Independence. And while we were there, there was a, a park ranger uh, because this is part of the National Park Service. Uh, a park ranger was there, and man, he was just he's like a nerd living his dream. Like he could talk about Independence Hall and Declaration of Independence. All day, every day, forever. That is that's what he does, actually. Um, but he was so excited saying all this stuff. And while we were in this room, he pulls out a uh, copy, a replica of the Declaration of Independence, and starts talking about how um, it was put together and how uh, Thomas Jefferson actually wrote his first draft 
and then that was uh, beat up and some things were taken out and it came to the final draft. But the ranger mentioned that Thomas Jefferson had written uh, about the evils of slavery in the Declaration in the first draft, but of course that was taken out because of slaveholder interests in the colonies. And man, I, I left that and was like, oh, I have to find this out. I have to read this because I've never heard this before. And it's true, if you Google it, you can find the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson actually, he comes up with a whole list of reasons why King George is the worst and why we need to become our own nation. And as he's going along in this list, um, he includes this part that I'm going to read here. He says, King George has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, Africa, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. You know, it's back in the day. This Piratical warfare, uh, I can't, I don't know what that next word is. Infidel piracy, he's saying this is evil. This is evil, and it is the warfare of the Christian King of Great Britain, in all caps. He's determined to keep an open market where men should be bought and sold. This was in the original draft that Thomas Jefferson wrote for the Declaration of Independence, but it was, of course, taken out. You know, Thomas Jefferson uh, was an interesting person. You know anything about him? Uh, he was a genius. He, along with the other founding fathers, had some revolutionary ideas, but he was just a messy character. When it comes to slavery, Jefferson was successful in ending the Atlantic slave trade in his home state of Virginia and then later for the whole United States, but in his whole lifetime, he enslaved over 600 African-American people. And he even wrote at one point that slavery, it, it's harmful to both the enslaved and the enslaver. But he had so many assets and all this debt that it was just too much for him to get rid of this thing that he thought was so evil. The truth is, whenever you look into American history, especially when it involves anything about race, you're going to be disappointed. Today, I want to help us lament. When I learn about American history, and I assume the same is true for you, we rarely lament anything. All of our founding fathers were amazing, righteous people. Maybe you were even taught they were doing the Lord's work by starting this nation. And in reality, most of the founding fathers, they, they had some revolutionary ideas that uh, a lot of them, I think, are uh, amazingly good for the world. But most of them, including good old George Washington himself, had slaves or benefited directly from enslaved labor. We tend to look at history very rose-colored glasses. You know, why do we do this? You know, I, I, I could just say, like, well, white supremacy and the holding on to power and privilege, but I want to get a little bit broader than that. Why do we look at history? Why do we look at certain things that happen and forget about lament? Maybe we never even think about lament. I think the first thing we do is we avoid lament through defiance. We're not, we're not here to lament, we're here to fight. We're ready to fight at any time. If y'all are on Twitter, then you know that this describes American culture right now. We are always ready for a fight. I mean, if, there, if we see anything online that you do not agree with, then you are ready to write a thread, you are right, ready to read a meme, you're ready to drop some knowledge. And then you realize that, oh, this, uh, this thing that I saw that I got all worked up about, it was a meme to begin with, it never really happened. <laughs> and I wasted 20 minutes of my life, uh, even though I saw a tweet email about it. Instead of lament, we choose denial. 
this is the easiest and quickest thing to go the, through. We just, we just deny that there's a problem at all. And then people come all surprised and perplexed when they can't ignore or deny an issue. We don't have racial issues in this neighborhood, but then a black family moves in and suddenly everyone has extremely strong opinions about race. And this is why the United States as a country has done very little to address the plethora of historic injustices done to Native American nations and peoples. It has denied everything. It has never apologized or made any true restitution for the wars that we waged against them, the displacing of hundreds of nations from their native lands, or the assimilation boarding schools of the 19th and 20th centuries that stripped away a people's culture and language. As a country, we have denied that it's even a problem or it's just not a big deal. Instead of lament, we could choose despair. There's nothing to be done. We can never change the system. We keep seeing clear video evidence of police brutality, but nothing changes. We keep seeing that compared to white women, the mortality rate of black women giving birth is three times higher and two times higher for their children. We keep seeing that schools and communities of color are woefully underfunded compared to predominantly white ones. Same old news. And God forbid we actually study the racial injustice throughout the history of our country. The unending examples of injustice coupled with violence against those who stand up against it can cause us to despair. Instead of lament, we could choose distraction. I think this is what most of us do, and I feel like Twitter is the king of this today. Rather than actually entering into the truth, of issues and events, we get into Twitter replies and threads that mostly devolve into whataboutism. Children are being separated from their parents at the border. Unaccompanied minors are, are, aren't given soap and toothpaste, and the response is, well, that same thing happened under Obama. What? If it did, it was 100% wrong then. The author of our passage today knows what it is like to face suffering and to be tempted by defiance, denial, despair, and distraction. Just by reading this psalm, you can tell that this person has been through what theologians call the dark night of the soul. He is beat down, frustrated, and overwhelmed. He's crying, questioning, and alone. Yet he writes a psalm. And in this raw emotional song, we learn a powerful principle. Soon Chong Ra, in his book Prophetic Lament, writes this. He says, lament in the Bible is a liturgical or worship response to the reality of suffering and engages God in the context of pain and trouble. The hope of lament is that God would respond to human suffering that is wholeheartedly communicated through lament. You see, biblical lament engages with God in the situation. You see, you're not going to find God in defiance, because God is God, and you are not. You're not going to find God with a spirit of denial, because God is a God of truth. You're not going to find God in a spirit of despair, because God is God of hope. And you're not going to find God in a spirit of distraction because God is never a distraction. You see, lament engages God in the reality of suffering. And it might sound a little counterintuitive, but if we can learn how to be a people who start with lament, I believe that God can use us to bring revolutionary change to this world. So at the beginning of this psalm, You'll, uh, all of the Psalms, actually, you'll see a bunch of front matter of instructions about uh, the author and some musical notations. And here we learn that the author is Haman the Ezraite. It's not He-Man. The most powerful man in the universe. Not, that's not him. It's Haman. Um, and there's a strong possibility that this person was a prominent worship leader in the temple during David and Solomon's reign. Uh, there's also a possibility that uh, Haman was simply one of King Solomon's advisors, known for his wisdom, who happened to write this psalm. But either way, we see that this man has walked closely with God for years, 
but is now experiencing a season of suffering, loneliness, and even rejection from God. And he starts out with the only positive verse that we really see in the entire psalm in, in verse 1. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Here the author is starting by addressing God as his savior. And he cries out to him day and night. In other words, this psalm has not come from a one-time prayer or a one-time event. He's been praying night and day over and over, pouring out his soul to God. Suffering and injustice are rarely one-time events, and if they are, they stick with you for a while. Our lament is not just to be a one-time thing, but really to become a part of our prayer lives. In verses 3 through 5, the psalmist lets God know exactly how he is feeling. If we look in verse 3, he says, I am overwhelmed with troubles. And my life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go to the pit. I'm like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. He lays out his case. He says, I'm overwhelmed with troubles, God. I can't take it anymore. I can't be on Twitter anymore. I can't see the news anymore. I feel like I'm going to die. Can I just say this morning that God can handle your emotions? He can handle your sorrow. He can handle your lament. He can handle your meltdowns before him. He's not thrown off. He's not offended. He's not surprised. The Bible says that we are created in God's image, and that includes emotion. Throughout the Bible, we see God filled with delight, filled with rage, filled with sorrow. That means that we can bring our whole selves to God, including our strong emotions of lament. If you think about it, God is the only one who you can truly be real in front of, be safe in front of. He already knows how you are feeling. He created you that way. So why would we not be our whole selves in front of him? He can handle it. And he can even handle when we blame him. Look at the next verse in verse 6. The psalmist says, you have put me in the lowest pit in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavy on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. Now, when we talk about blaming God for something, I think most of the time we're not necessarily saying, like, God, you did this to me, but God, you allowed this to happen. Why did you allow this? God allows racism, white supremacy, systemic injustice to happen every day. God allowed his own people to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. He allowed that to happen. And I don't have an easy answer for why. But I do know that he can handle our blame. In verse 10 through 12, he goes on to say that dead people cannot testify about God's salvation. In verse 10, do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? The answer is no. He's pretty much saying, God, if you don't save me, I can't tell people of your salvation. As I was studying this, I realize that lament takes death seriously. It looks at it head on, and it brings it to God. Last summer while I was in seminary, I took a class that was really life-changing 
Uh, it was called Martin and Malcolm and a Theology of Justice. And uh, just by the title, I'm like, ooh, okay. Uh, it followed Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, during, the, uh, during both of their ministries and kind of uh, compared both of them uh, towards uh, finding a Christian theology uh, seeking justice. And I remember the, I think it was the second class that we were together and we were going through um, history, really, talking about the civil rights movement in the South. And as uh, Dr. King was in uh, the, doing the, um, the bus boycott, uh, and throughout that whole period, we were talking specifically about white churches and how the vast majority of them were either silent or outright against Dr. King. And if you know the, the, the letter, from Dr. King's letter from Birmingham prison, it is written in response to 10 white pastors who wrote into the local paper calling for Dr. King to stop what he was doing. And you know, as I first started to think about this, um, you know, Dr. King was preaching the gospel. The gospel, you know, the, the good news about Jesus. And, and this is what evangelical churches, that's what we're all about. We're all about the gospel of Jesus. And Dr. King was showing clearly how the gospel speaks against racism. And I started to realize that when it comes to uh, uh, white uh, churches in this country, just preaching the gospel is not enough. It isn't enough. Because it didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., like, who else could do a better job? And it took me to a dark place. And uh, I, I've started saying something recently. Uh, white supremacy runs deep. It just runs deep. It's, it's made its way into the fabric of everything in this country. At an early point in Dr. King's ministry, he went to a dark place, and God met him and transformed him in his ministry, and specifically when he faced death. Now, at this point in his ministry, he had, fa he had, he had a lot of death threats. He would get an average of 40 a day. But they hadn't really phased him. He was like, that's just part of it. You know, we're going to move ahead. But he writes at one, uh, at one point, um, you know, he got an yet another call on his telephone, a death threat. And he just can't get it out of his mind for some reason. This one is really sticking with him. And he starts to think about, uh, you know, what if he's killed and he leaves his wife and children? But what if his wife and children are killed? And what if all of them are killed and he just can't stop thinking about this? And uh, he gets up in the middle of the night, makes some coffee, goes into his kitchen, and he writes this. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In the state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that night are still vivid in my memory. He prays, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, but, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, he writes, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Martin Luther, stand up for justice. Stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. Three days later, 
A bomb blasted his house, and his family escaped harm by a hair's breadth. Strangely enough, King later wrote, I accepted the word of the bombing calmly. My religious experience a few nights before had given me the strength to face it. In some ways, we must face the reality of death and lament, bringing it to God in order to overcome it. In the next verse, verse 13, the psalmist gives a final prayer for help. He asks the question we all ask, and he ends with lament. Verse 13, but I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before me. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? He finishes, darkness is my closest friend. Why, God? Why? Why have you allowed this to happen? And he finishes tired, overwhelmed, and alone. You know, I am so glad that this psalm has made it all of these years, thousands of years, without somebody slapping a but praise the Lord on the end of this. We don't need a praise the Lord. Sometimes you got to stay in that dark place. Because that is where God will meet you. You've got to stay in the lament, in the darkness, because God knows that it is the sin of this world that he hates, that breaks his heart, that makes him lament. You see, when we enter into lament, we engage God in something he is already engaged with. He's already there in the lament. The very existence of this psalm is the answer to how, how could he do this? How could the psalmist write this psalm? He is in his darkest hour, and he's praying. He says it five times throughout the psalm. He says, I cry out day and night. My prayer comes before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I call to you, Lord, every day. I cry to you for help, Lord. You see, prayer of lament is essential when we face suffering and injustice. Could I help us see how we could practice lament with something happening today in the news? You know, someone recently asked me, what should we do about this entire situation at the border with these internment camps and everything that's happening? What should we do? Now, this person that was asking me the question has a very different worldview than I do. Um, and, you know, we could have gotten into specifics on policies and politics, uh, maybe even theology. But when I thought about it, I was like, our minds are already made up about what we think about what's going on. And then I was preparing this message of lament. And I started to think, you know, what all of us need to do, regardless of where we fall on the political spectrum or what we think about policies, is to lament. So can I walk us through this? We need to lament that several Central American countries are experiencing economic catastrophe. It's terrible. We need to lament that as their northern neighbor, we have done little to help the situation. In fact, we've often made things worse. We, lead, we need to lament. We need to lament that the local governments have not been able to stop the growth and tyranny of gang violence and control. We need to lament. We need to lament that there are parents of children who face the choice of either their child joining the gang for what will be a terrible and probably short life or just being killed by the gang right away. We need to lament. We need to lament that families and children see no other option than to flee to the United States, a country where they don't speak the language that isn't their culture, that is hundreds, thousands of miles away. We need to lament that this is the choice they face. 
We need to lament just the sheer number of people asking for asylum right now. These are real people. There's so many that we must lament. Finally, we need to lament the way in which these people are being treated at our borders and throughout our country in internment camps. We must lament. You see, when we go to lament, we're not talking about politics anymore or policies or anything like that. We're just lamenting. And as we lament these things, we cry out, Lord, help! Intervene! Hear our cry day and night. But how? How can we lament? Aren't we just going to become more discouraged, more weary, more angry, more overwhelmed? This is why I love this psalm. You see, Psalm 88 starts with a powerful verse. The psalmist says, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Literally, Yahweh, God of my salvation. God of my salvation and that I'm already saved and you have the future in mind. I will be saved in the future. You are my salvation. You see, as I read this psalm of lament, I can see the Savior everywhere. The psalmist enters into lament, pouring out his soul to God. But there was another man who poured out his soul before God. In Matthew 26, verse 38, before he was arrested and crucified, Jesus told his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. The psalmist felt completely alone, abandoned by his friends and neighbors. But there was another man who was truly abandoned by his friends in his darkest hour, the moment Jesus was arrested in Matthew 26, 56. It says, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. The psalmist felt like he was abandoned by God. But there was another man who was abandoned by God. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, he quoted another psalm. Psalm 22, 1, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, Jesus was truly separated from God, abandoned by him, taking the full wrath of the sins of the world of God on himself. The psalmist declares that the dead cannot testify. But there was another man. I said there was another man. And he testifies from the grave. He may have died on the cross, but he rose three days later with the keys of life and death in his hands. That means that all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth has been given to him. And he enters into the racism and the white supremacy and the systemic injustice, and he tears it down, putting it to death on the cross. And this is why we can enter into lament. This is why we can talk about the history of racism in our country. This is why we can talk about white supremacy and challenge systemic injustice and why we protest and why we speak up because we believe that Jesus has all authority. That the corrupt systems of this world will bow down to him and be put to death. I want you to imagine a church this morning that is able to enter into this kind of lament. When suffering comes as we fight for justice, when racism comes up to the surface again through some economic concerns, when white supremacy rears its ugly head separating families and refusing to give soap and toothpaste to children, when systemic racism starts to gentrify a neighborhood, 
I want you to imagine a church that won't be led by a spirit of defiance, that won't be derailed by denial, that won't be paralyzed by despair, that won't be lost in distraction. I want you to imagine a church that enters into the reality of the situation, that calls God to do something. Imagine a church that, go, that chooses to suffer, to join with those who are suffering. And imagine a church that cries out for justice day and night. May the gathering of Harlem be that church. Mm. Join me in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning with heavy hearts. I know this isn't the message that many people came in here wanting to hear, but it's the message you gave me. God, would you transform us by the power of your spirit. Transform us to be like you, Jesus, who didn't see us suffering in our sin, leaving us alone, but you came to us. You entered into the sorrow, the death, the lament the sin. You entered in. God, would you transform us to be people who enter in? Even though it's hard, even though we will face confrontation, even though we may feel alone, God, remind us that we are never alone. That all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you and that you are with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray.